breath of dawn make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hands. You who dwell in the shelter of the Lord, who abide in his shadow for life, say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock, in whom I trust. And he will raise you up on eagles' wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hands. For to his angels he's given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up Lest you dash your foot against a stone And he will raise you up on eagle's wings Bear you on the breath of dawn Make you to shine like the sun And hold you in the palm of his hand, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Greetings, welcome to this Transfiguration Sunday worship service. We are First Presbyterian Church of Fond du Lac. We are Christians serving, learning, and loving. And this is our worship service for February 14th of 2021. We're glad that you can join together in this time to be able to celebrate God's love and grace for all people. We have a couple things coming up and hope that you'll get a chance to join us. We have our fellowship time, our coffee hour on Sunday morning at 9 a.m via Zoom, and that's followed on the same link by an education hour that includes Talkback, which is a time to talk about the themes of the service in the day. That takes place at 10 a.m. Those links are in emails that are sent out on Wednesday and Saturday. If you haven't been included in receiving those emails, let me know at RevJHarrison at FDLPresbyterian.org. We're very grateful for the great outpouring of support with the Youth Super Bowl of Caring that took place on Sunday. We received a very delightful and substantial gift of toilet paper, peanut butter, and soup that is going to go to the Fondi Food Pantry. It's a very helpful part of what they need to distribute for this community. And we were so thrilled to be able to take part in sharing God's blessings in this way. If you'd like to still make a donation, you can do so through our website or directly to the Fondy Food Pantry. We have Ash Wednesday coming up on a week on this Wednesday, the 17th. That'll start with a virtual soup supper. We're going to have a fellowship time from 5.30 to 6.30. At 6.30, we will have our Ash Wednesday service that will include communion. And so you'll want to have your own communion supplies available. And we will enter into a beginning of a Lenten practice workshop that's going to be taking place following the Ash Wednesday service. We'll have these Lenten services at 6.30 and the Ash Wednesday workshop, or probably the Lenten workshop each Wednesday following through the season of Lent. The materials for the workshop are also available for you to use at home if you prefer with your family or individually. We're going to be going through a series of practices intended for us to be able to open our hearts through love and forgiveness to experiencing the light and presence of Christ in a new way. I do hope that you'll take this time in Lent to be an opportunity for growth, for renewal, and for God's love and blessing. 
Now let's take a moment to prepare our hearts to open ourselves to God's blessings and rejoice in the gifts that God has given us. As the light of Christ comes into our midst, let's prepare to worship God. Life can seem mysterious and confusing, but in the presence of Christ our Lord, there is clarity. Come see the great work God has been doing from the foundations of the earth to bring healing and peace to all nations. We have come to see Christ our Lord and Savior. We have come to worship God. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life, your light shines in our lives and your glory is revealed through your Son, Jesus Christ. Reveal his glory to us as you did to Peter, James, and John, that we may be filled with his power and our mouths may may proclaim his presence to all the world. Enable us to become full of your light so that we may share your peace with all of the world. Amen. Please join me in offering our prayer of confession. Patient Lord, you know how we tend to doubt those things that are beyond our understanding and control. Our spirits and our senses are easily fooled, and we question anything that is unexpected. We would be just like the disciples at first not believing what we are seeing and then wanting to make a monument to the event. Thank you for being so patient with us. Forgive us when we get so wrapped up in the moment that we don't take time enough to understand its significance. Help us pause, reflect, think, and thank you for the blessings of unexpected revelations. Give us wisdom and strength to be your disciples, proclaiming your transforming love to all people. Amen. And please take a few moments for your own silent confession. God has revealed to you the love and presence of Jesus, our Savior. We have been blessed by God to witness and proclaim God's love to all. 
Through the love of Jesus and the grace of God's presence, we have been forgiven. Thanks be to God for the presence of Christ, which renews our faith and reveals to us God's loving presence. Amen. The first scripture reading today comes from one of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. So from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the believers, of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So full of fear where once was hope Remember God still loves the world Be still my soul Beneath the shadow of each storm In all the sorrow and despair Remember God still loves the world
all your striving find his peace become a shining light of grace and show that God still loves the world be still my soul Our gospel lesson for this Transfiguration Sunday comes from the gospel according to Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. The context of this passage is very important. Immediately before this passage, the disciples were with Jesus in Caesarea Philippi. This is a little more than halfway through the years of his ministry. And Jesus asks the disciples two questions. The first is, who do people say that I am? And then the second one is, who do you say that I am? And Peter, speaking in many ways on behalf of the rest of the disciples, affirmed, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And in that moment, there was this powerful affirmation and relationship that was bonded towards Jesus and towards their ministry. But it immediately was disrupted as Peter then began to object to Jesus saying that the Messiah needed to suffer and die. And so that's what leads to the flow to the passage which we will have, the transfiguration. What's important to note also is what happens after this passage. The disciples come down from the Mount of Transfiguration to a failure to be able to deal with a very simple and routine act of mercy, an act of casting out evil. And the problem is because it needs to be done with prayer and fasting. Essentially that it's their character, their personhood, that is essential in terms of accomplishing God's work. And so the transfiguration is encapsulated between these moments this tremendous high of affirming Christ and this low of them knowing they're not the people they need to be in order to accomplish what God is calling them to do. And so it's in the middle of this that we come to the Mount of Transfiguration and the experience of seeing Jesus in the fullness of the gospel. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and went up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared as to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. May the Lord bless us and teach us through the gift of this word. Please join me in prayer. Jesus, our Savior, we're accustomed to thinking that our faith is our business, our personal experience, and our work. Most of the time, We kind of think of our faith like a vitamin, something that will add to our quality of life and make us stronger, and that way it is worth the cost. But you're inviting us to do so much more. You're inviting us to be transformed, renewed. You're inviting us to freedom and to real joy. Holy Lord, we need to experience your love and presence in a way that renews our commitment and draws us again into submitting to real discipleship we realize that we're not able to do for ourselves what we need in order to live in the freedom and the peace of salvation. 
We find ourselves particularly uncertain and weary at this time with the events of this past year and with our uncertainty of the future. So we pause now, Lord Jesus, to affirm you as our one path of wholeness and peace. We recognize that you are more than something we just add to our lives or what we have assumed you to be. And we need you to take us from where we are now to the place of fullness and life and real joy that makes our lives complete. We pray this in the name of Christ, our Holy Lord. Amen. Transfiguration Sunday is one of those markers of the year. It is the Sunday before we enter into the journey of Lent. It's less known and less focused upon than, say, Easter and Christmas or even Pentecost. But it's very important because it is understood to be the moment at which Jesus is seen in context. And that experience of seeing Jesus in context with the law and the prophets, with the holy work of God, with God's nature himself, the disciples understand that they don't understand. They realize that their assumptions are not entirely correct and that they need to rethink some things. They need to reconsider some things. They need to see some things very differently. And in this year, this could be a very important part of our growth in Christ, especially as we continue our journey through the pandemic. We're coming up on a year. It was in the midst of Lent that we first had to cancel in-person worship services. I remember thinking for a couple of weeks, we're just going to have to suspend what we're doing. And it's funny to think how naive we were in that time and in that place. We seemed to think we had a grasp on what to expect. We would delay a little bit. We'd actually take this as a chance to just catch up a little bit. So many families were thinking it'd be nice to spend a night home. I remember so many of the things in which we were saying and ways that we were perceiving things that were so out of touch with the reality that was coming upon us. And then we were so divided, both in our nation, in our culture, in our congregation, and even in ourselves. Over and over, it felt like we're overreacting. We're responding with more than really is necessary. And then the deaths began to occur. And at the same time, we had people who were experiencing this tremendous anxiety and worry over loved ones, loss of friends, and at the same time, people who refused to wear a mask at pick and save. We had this combination of those who were saying, let's just let everything go and everybody go back to normal life. And those who were warning of the death to come. And what's changed us is the way in which the number of deaths have continued to escalate. Do you remember being appalled at 100 deaths a day? And then it was 1,000. And then the deaths continued to accumulate nationally and even in our state and in our community. And then somewhere in all of that, I think we even lost touch of what those numbers meant, that each of those was a life, each of those was a family. We're still not sure on how to put any of this into real perspective. And we've come to this point in which we have the hope of the vaccine, but math is against us. Because even as it's been announced this week that a third of those 65 and older have had their first dose, that means that there's over 600,000 people who have yet to have their first of two dosage. Those are big numbers. This is going to take a while. And how we put this into perspective is going to have a lot to do with who we are as Christians. 
as the body of Christ. Our response is in many ways one of the most faith-based things we do. Now, we're Presbyterians. It's common to disagree with the pastor, and you're welcome to do so, but at least consider this. There is no Christianity without community. There is no following Jesus' teaching without concern and love for our neighbor. By the way, that same teaching is also embedded in Judaism and in Islam, Buddhism and Hindu. So if you're not gonna be concerned about your neighbor, I think Greek mythology or some of the Druidic stuff is probably what you're gonna have to look into. If we are going to be faithful to God, we are going to be concerned about one another. We are going to be responsible for one another. There is no means by which we can justify ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ and not be conscious of our responsibility for our community, for our nation, and for our world, and for the health of all of the people in all of these places. And so this puts us in a position in which we realize that we have been operating on some perceptions, some thoughts, and some beliefs. But if we've learned anything this last year, especially going from March of last year to today, sometimes we don't get it right. Sometimes we don't see things as they really are. And sometimes we really don't know what it is that's happening in our midst. So we come to the transfiguration and it's a good time to be open to seeing differently, to being reset by God in our perception and on our understanding. We have to recognize that we are in a time in which openness to God's renewal and God's transformation has to become has to start with letting go, letting go some of our assumptions, some of our thoughts, some of our manners, and some of our ways. This is so embedded in the message of the transfiguration, and it's so important for us. The Jewish people had been looking for the Messiah for 400 years. From the fall of the empire that had been set up by Alexander the Great, the Greek dominance of that region, there had been prophecies and expectation that God would raise up a mighty leader who would bring righteousness to the world, to the people, to all the, the nations. And they looked for a Messiah who would be the one who would lead the people so that righteousness and justice would abound. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They were very confident in what Messiah meant. The problem was that their knowledge and their expectations of Messiah didn't line up with God's expectations. The Disciples went up the Mount of Transfiguration thinking they knew exactly who Jesus was and what he was to do. They expected the Messiah to institute a rule in which they were on top and everybody else would essentially follow instructions and do what they said. And if the mighty warrior of God, the Messiah, didn't know who it was that needed smiting, the disciples would be happy to make a list for him. They were very confident exactly how the world needed to be put in the right order. The only thing is, they were completely out of step with what God was doing. The disciples had found the Messiah, but they couldn't get the Messiah to get with the program. They wanted the Messiah to get started on confronting the inequities, the tax collectors, the Roman centurions, the religious leaders who 
took advantage of the people. But this namby-pamby Messiah was wanting to focus on other things. He didn't seem to understand all that needed to be done. And they were feeling this need to get him with the program. So this was a great time. They were going up the mountain. They were going to have a chance to step back. It was just going to be executive council of Peter and James and John and Andrew. And the four of them with Jesus be able to scope this thing out and start the planning. And so this is what sets up transfiguration. The disciples don't really seem to know the transfiguration is about to take place, that something amazing is about to happen in front of them. And so they're very much unprepared for what God was going to show them. What's fascinating is that the transfiguration emerges in Mark's gospel and in the other gospels in this series of elements of a vision, series of powerful awareness. First is this transformation of Jesus's clothes. And it's interesting that it's Jesus's clothes that are transformed into dazzling white, whiter than could be done by any human means. It isn't Jesus that's different. It isn't even the type of clothing that's different. It's not become priestly raiment. It hasn't become kingly robes, it's the same clothes. But the sight shows this purity and this holiness and this power. And see, this is what sets up this powerful notation in the transfiguration. It isn't that the divine has come down it's that the humanity has been seen in its divine glory. That what always has been in front of them, Jesus wearing the same tunic, the same sandals, the same things, but they suddenly see that it's the humanity that is so powerful and so transforming and so engaged in bringing salvation. And then the next element of the transfiguration is Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. Now, what's fascinating with this is that we understand the Messiah is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. We don't know exactly how they knew this was Moses and Elijah. Perhaps there were name tags. Presumably, there was a divine knowledge right at that moment. But what's so powerful and profound about it is it's the persons of Moses and Elijah, not the abstract law, not the inspired prophecy, but the humanity that is gathered together on that mount. That humanity and God's divine work are being seen in a context together that the disciples had not understood. And all of a sudden, in this glory and in this power and in this great gift, they see divinity. But they see divinity in the context of humanity. And it's a little disturbing and disorienting. And this moves into the third part of this vision experience. Because Peter not knowing what to say, the passage says, began speaking. Rule of thumb. If you don't know what to say, don't start talking. It isn't going to end well. Mark Twain once said, a man could remain silent and many would probably think that he's dumb or he can begin speaking and eliminate all doubt. That's what Peter did. And in his speaking, he showed his lack of understanding. Let's make three tents up here. It can become an exhibit. We can bring people up for the program. Peter is still trying to hold on to his assumptions, 
to his perceptions, to his beliefs about who Messiah is and what Messiah is there to do, even as he has a vision that is disrupting all of his beliefs and his expectations. And it's in the midst of that that Peter finds himself struggling with the knowledge of what God is doing. We're in the middle of this pandemic ourselves where the Jewish people had the Romans, they had the religious leaders, they had all of these different groups that were disruptive and destruction, destructive and kept them from being able to live their full lives. We've had a virus. We've had political upheavals and some injustice, but above all, we have had a circumstance where we've needed to practice distance and concern. Intelligence and wisdom has called us to a higher life. And we are in the midst of a time in which those who want to hold on tight to their assumptions that they know what's right, those who want to cling to their beliefs, that they are sure of God's direction are the ones who are going to be the most heavily disappointed. There is this element in faith that it's not our doubts that trip us up. It isn't our questions and our uncertainties that cause us difficulty. It is our confidence and in the things that we believe. Confidence is what has often led to some of the worst of what Christians have done to other people. It is with great confidence that the Inquisition took place in Spain, causing the death of many whose belief was slightly different. The confidence has led to crusades, and it was with great confidence that people attacked our nation's capital in the expectation of being able to put what they believed and were confident was right into place. Confidence is not our problem. It's a lack of awareness. It is a lack of understanding. It's a lack of openness to God doing something different from what we are expecting. When the disciples went up that mountain, they had a clear knowledge of exactly what God was doing, who the Messiah is, and what their role was going to be. They came down from the mountain and immediately experienced this stumbling of doubt, this realization of not knowing what it was that they thought they knew, this disruption to their expectations and their belief. And thanks be to God that happened because confidence would have meant they would have never been able to serve Christ in a way that was effective. They would have never been able to be the leaders in the church that they became. They would have never been able to share a gospel. Confidence has this way of creating a veil, a blockage, an inability to see. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the passage from 2 Corinthians that was read for you today. In the 2 Corinthians is actually at least the third and possibly fourth letter in communication between the Apostle Paul and the church in Corinth. And in between the two, there had also been a visit from Paul that was extremely harsh and unpleasant. And in all of these things, there was this moment of deep shame that they experienced in the church because as Paul began to reveal to them the gospel and the degree to which they had departed from their faith, they came to an awareness that was devastating for them. So what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the veil in the chapter previous to what we read was that when Moses came down from talking to God, he would wear a veil on his face because 
the divine light that was absorbed by Moses when he was in communion with God was painful for the Israelites to see. It reflected to them how far it was they needed to go and caused them to realize their own deep shame and their need for repentance. And so Paul takes this image of the veil and that the gospel is veiled for those who are unprepared to be exposed to that experience of awareness. That the veil is this means by which many in the world deflect the assumptions and the beliefs that they hold so clearly and so tightly that those are wrong. We are in this position as we come into this season of Lent of being invited to recognize that it's the light of Christ that opens to us an understanding of what needs to be let go, what needs to be transformed, what needs to be changed. And we can especially remember that it was just shy of a year ago that we were real confident we knew how to do church, we knew how to manage fellowship, we knew exactly what we were doing, and we were wrong. And it's at this point that if we are faithful and we are aware that we bow before God and submit our hearts to Christ and say, show us now where our assumptions have gone wrong, where our beliefs are not worthy, where our intentions are not aligned with what God is accomplishing. And let us see Christ anew, not just the divinity, but let us see the humanity as well, because it's in the elevating of that humanity, it's in the power of God working through human flesh that Christ was able to bring salvation to all of the world. And more than that, it was in that humanity that the disciples were able to bring the message of God's love throughout Rome, throughout all of the world. We're being called to this time of setting aside our assumptions to putting on the altar of God's love the sacrifice of our being certain about what our roles are, how we're supposed to do them, who we believe ourselves to be. And in this season of Lent, it is a wonderful time to open ourselves to God speaking to us anew, showing us what it is that we are intended to become and to allowing Christ to renew us in a greater and more powerful gift of love. This is the gift that God is giving to us this day. Please join me in prayer. Jesus, we struggle with the ways in which we so deeply want and think that we should be acting and what truly is your call to us in righteousness and using our gifts we are becoming more aware that we need to see things differently, to perceive your work and your presence in new ways. And like the disciples, we are entering into this continuing time with assumptions and with confidence of the things that need to be fixed in the world around us and what we see as our role in doing that. We think we are sure and correct in identifying the things that are broken and whose fault it is and which things that need to be punished. Into your hands we give our assumptions. Upon your altar we place our confidence. And we ask you to shine a light which opens us to seeing completely differently. We know it's your loving gift to disrupt and transform our thinking like you did for the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we welcome that work taking place in our lives today. Help us to be open to your loving touch and your light. Speak to us so that we can release our grip 
on what we assume to be true. Remove the veils from our sight so that we might see ourselves and the world around us with your call to community and compassion, love and support. Let us live as your disciples. And now draw us together with all of your children in all of the world so that with faith and trust, we might pray together the words you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and in life everlasting. Amen. We thank you for joining with us. We are First Presbyterian Church of Fond du Lac. You can find us on the web at www.fdlpresbyterian.org. And if you have something you want to say, I'm always happy to hear from you at Rev. J. Harrison at fdlpresbyterian.org. God's blessings be with you and your family. Stay safe. We look forward to when we can be together again. Lord, bid your servant go in peace. Your word is now fulfilled. His eyes have seen salvation dawn. His child's heart.